Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I especially appreciate not being sort of forced to sit down to a lunch the day after, or the, after the Thanksgiving weekend, because I always say I'm very good at avoiding food, but I cannot resist it. So if it's in front of me, I will eat it, but now it's not in front of me, so I appreciate that. Um, I want to talk today, as you just pointed out, um, revisiting a theory that my colleagues and I advanced in 1991. I want to take you through some of my thinking and how I got there, um, because unlike many of you, I learned nothing about evolution as a primary school child, as a, social, as a secondary school child, as a college student, or as a graduate student. I am very late in getting to this perspective, um, but you know, I find it fascinating, as I hope I can convey. And I got introduced to it. In fact, the truth be told, I was introduced to evolutionary thinking long before, at least in some form or another, long before this paper by Draperding and Harpending came out in 1982 in the Journal of the Anthropological Research. But like so many of my social science and developmental science brethren, even to this day, I was resistant to, if not agonistic, ag antagonistic toward evolution, an evolutionary mindset. Um, like all too many of my developmental brethren and social science brethren today, I glibly, naively, and misguidedly equated it with kind of a biological determinism and pitted it against a more favored environmentalism. Um, but um, this statement by Draper and Harpington on father absence and reproductive strategy and evolutionary perspective really changed the way fundamentally I thought and I think. And indeed, there's even an interesting personal history here where I came to this paper not because I ran across it in the literature, um, but Pat Draper was coming through, visiting people in my department at Penn State at the time, basically because we were getting a freebie hire, because her husband at the time, Henry Harpending, was being hired as a hire of opportunity in the anthropology department. And nobody knew really what to make of Pat. Well, she studied old age. Um, there were plenty of people at Penn State in my department who, studied, who were gerontologists. But they weren't studying the Kung Bushmen in the Kalahari, so she didn't quite fit in. Um, but it was a freebie, and we weren't going to say no, but we had this strange duck who came to our offices and talked about things in Darwinian terms, which was you know, news to all but one person in the department of over 20 faculty, I'm certain. Or certainly was news in terms of what they read and digest on a daily, weekly, annual basis. And so Pat came in, and I chatted with her, um, as I would anybody, any candidate for a job. And she left on my desk this paper. Now, I used to keep on my desk a pile of papers that someday I'll get through, who knows when, if, or what. Um, and it sat there for months, for months. And one day, I had some downtime. You know, um, this was before you could spend your downtime surfing the internet um, kind of thing. And, or doing your banking or whatever else we might do today when we have downtime in the office. So I picked this paper up and read it. And it really intrigued me. And I sometimes wonder, what if I had just taught that paper away? Where would I be today in my thinking? Um, and I was very interested in this notion of reproductive strategy, which I took to mean a coordinated suite of developments and ways of behaving that rather than thinking about being you know, a little sexual, sexually promiscuous, rather than thinking about teenage pregnancy, rather than thinking of antisocial behavior, rather than thinking of being a young parent, rather than thinking about being a not very skilled parent, what we had here was a package of phenotypes, if you would, uh, you didn't use the term back then, that created, that was defined a reproductive strategy. That to me was fascinating. And the idea that it might be affected by things happened earlier in life was directly up the mainstream of my thinking because as a developmental psychologist, I was interested and remain interested in the effects of early experience on development. I didn't have much interest in father absence per se, um, but this was basically an early developmental a, a theory of how early exposures shape later development. Um, as I thought, now central to the claim of this theory was that females raised in father absent households, households show early expression of sexual interest and assumption of sexual activity, negative attitudes toward males, and poor ability to establish long-term relationships with one male. Well, this is just the kind of thing development, developmentalists have been studying. Now, the truth be told, 
they had abandoned father absence a long time ago. And this led me to make a developmental critique, of, but, but an appreciative one, of what Pat and Henry were saying. Was, was this any more than old wine in a new bottle? That is, developmentalists had studied for years father absence and later development. In fact, the reason there was a literature for Draper and Harpenter to go to and reinterpret was a direct function of Freudian theory, which by the early 80s had long been abandoned by any mainstream <coughs> developmental psychologist. But in the 40s, on the basis of analytic thinking that the superego came out of boys' identification with their fathers through the process of castration anxiety and identification with the aggressor, came the notion that that's why boys develop a superego. And in fact, that led to that notion of the role of father in the development of superego led to two testable predictions. The first was that males would be, have stronger superegos than females, because females didn't have a dynamic of father absence and castration, rather of castration, anxiety, and identification, and aggression to deal with. I'm not going to talk anymore about that. But it also led, so people said, in a very scientifically minded way, if father is so critical for the superego, i.e. moral development, then what happens to people without fathers? And so there was a literature. And lo and behold, it purported to show just what Harpening and Draper, Draper and Harpening had found, that these girls grew up more sexually promiscuous, more sexually active, um, et cetera. So what we had here was taking the input father absence, the output sexual behavior, replacing one theoretical framework and putting another theoretical framework in. So to me, that was very interesting alternative theoretical framework, <coughs> but where's the added value as opposed to storytelling? Moreover, my understanding of the law of parsimony said you take the simpler explanation rather than the more complex. So if I could explain the effects of father absence by social learning theory or attachment theory or life course sociological thinking, which really just talked about what your experience of relationships was and that, how, you, how we, we affected your psychological functioning, why would it be parsimonious to drag in you know, the forces of evolution here? Now, Pat Draper and I used to have conversations about this in the hallway all the time. And I was clear that we weren't communicating. Because for Pat, somebody schooled in evolutionary thinking, this was, bio, this was basic foundational stuff. You didn't have to justify an evolutionary mindset. It didn't have to prove itself. But for me, who came out of a field in which evolution was and remains all too absent, um, this was an issue. Third, as a developmentalist, I wanted to know how father absence, not just why father absence, came to affect these later developments? How was it instantiated? What was the development mechanism or process? Really, the truth be told, as far as I could tell, Draper and Harpington didn't have one. They just had a notion that this led to that, and this was part of the process of natural selection vis-a-vis -vis reproductive strategies. OK. And finally, and most critically, my understanding of the structure of scientific revolutions is understanding Kuhn was that what a new theoretical framework, and to me this was brand new, had to do was it had to explain what we already knew, but had to advance new predictions that if confirmed, other theories couldn't account for and wouldn't have advanced. And as far as I could tell, everything that Draper and Harpenden were arguing, we could already account for with other theories, and they were accounted for by other theories. So this was a place where, but I would say the first and only time in my career, I struggled with an intellectual problem and scratching my head. I was very intrigued by the idea of reproductive strategy. I liked the notion of natural selection as I now understood it, because all of a sudden it turned, which it should be always, an evolutionary perspective into an environmental discipline. It wasn't biological determinism. This was a theory of nurture. Sure, it was a nature-based theory of nurture, but it was a theory of nurture, so it should not. So it was naturally appealing to me, and I thought would be naturally appealing to my developmental brethren. As you'll see, I was naive on that score. So I struggled with the original prediction until one day I was teaching a class and it hit me that these experiences, and father absence just being one of them, I never was attracted to the notion that it, in particular, to me it was just one of a multiplicity of markers of risk in the development environment. One day it hit me, my goodness, what's going on here is these are processes that affect the timing of puberty. And here, for the first time, if that was so, we would have 
a prediction that no standing standard social science model theory could explain, much less anticipate. Um, and I was very excited. It was like a eureka moment. And I remember going home from that class and typing out a note and giving it to Ann Peterson, my chair, who was a developmental psychologist who studied puberty, and Pat Draper, um, almost like I was documenting that here's the idea. This is where it originated. Um, you know, I've got this. But I didn't know if there was any evidence. Well, one day, I was sitting talking with Henry Harpenick. And he said, well, it's interesting. And he mentioned that somebody had some data that was in line with this. Well, and before I had heard that, I developed, basically, an idea that would have come out in a 1991 paper with Larry Steinberg and Pat Draper called Childhood Experience, Interpersonal Development, and Reproductive Strategy in Evolutionary Theory of Socialization. I was recasting traditional developmental theories of socialization in evolutionary biological terms, or so I thought. And it was pretty straightforward. The notion was that the family context affects <coughs> child rearing, child rearing affects psychological and behavioral development, and eventually what goes by the name of reproductive strategy, but here, 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 the first three boxes and the fifth are all standard developmental psychology notions. That is, that under conditions of, let's say, marital discord, economic stress, or other stress, parents' quality of parenting is undermined, what too many developmental psychologists, even to this day, call optimal parenting, a term I'm forever repudiating. Um, this promotes insecure attachment, mistrustful internal working model, and an opportunistic interpersonal orientation. I'm going to stay away from this for the time being. And thereby we get, quote, dysfunctional, dysregulated, problematical behavior, i.e., earlier sexual activity, short-term unstable pair bonds, <coughs> limited parental investment, i.e., in the parlance of developmental psychologists, poor or non-optimal parenting. That's all straightforward traditional developmental psychology. And over here, you get basically the opposite. <clears throat> Spousal harmony, adequate resources, low stress, foster sensitive, supportive, positive, responsive, positive affection, i.e., quote, optimal parenting, thereby secure attachment, trusting orientation toward the world, a reciprocally rewarding interpersonal orientation, and thereby, again, according to standard attachment theory, social learning theory, life course sociology thinking, later onset of sexual activity, long term enduring, high quality pair bonds although we wouldn't call them pair bonds in developmental psychology, and greater parental investment, i.e. more optimal parental investment, optimal parenting. But what was new and original was the prediction that this process is going to affect somatic development. And what we're going to do here is we're going to see earlier maturation and earlier onset of puberty, and here we're going to see later maturation and a later onset of puberty. Um, and so to me it seemed that if this turns out to be the case, then you can no longer walk around thinking of A, B, C, and E in your traditional framework. Um, and so I went around sharing this idea. And the first place I shared it was, well, one of the first places I shared it was walking into a bar one day at a conference in Ivoscula, Finland. Um, and who was sitting there but my, a young man who I knew was getting to know, eventually turned out to be a close friend and colleague. Um, who my son has just recently got a PhD with, Ashlam Caspi, um, and he was sitting at a bar with a woman that I didn't know. And um, being the sort of um, New Yorker that I am, I just walked up to them and they were talking, I said hello, and I overheard they were conversing about puberty, and I said, I've got a puberty hypothesis for you. And they turned around and we... Um, Ashlam introduced me to the woman who would become his wife, Tammy Moffat, and she said, what is it? And I said, just what I've said here, that you're under these conditions, you'd get earlier pubertal development. Under those conditions, you'd get later pubertal <coughs> development. And Kemi didn't say, like somebody get my development of bread, who cares? Or that's ridiculous, or so what? She said, we can test that. And so that's what we set out to do. And that yielded this paper. Um, and in fact, the previous paper only would have, I only went ahead and wrote once we had these data, because I knew unless I had some data to bring to this hypothesis, no self-respecting journal was going to publish it. And I didn't know about journals that just published hypotheses. And lo and behold, what we found looking at the Dunedin Longitudinal Birth Cohort was that, in fact, those who matured earlier not only weighed um, more at age nine, 
but they had a little bit more behavior problems, not much, but they had poorer family context and greater father absence, just as we just as the theory predicted. Now, Temi's inclination at the time, not unreasonably, was to interpret these data in behavior genetic heritability terms. That the same factors that are leading you know, parents to create conflicted families and fathers to leave, those, the genetic, those genes are passed on to daughters who then behave this way. So we've got a behavior genetic masquerade here rather than an environmentally induced socialization process. And there was also evidence and this is in the days before we had PowerPoint, um, hard as that may be believed for some of you to believe. Um, and we see here the evidence in a correlational manner. These are just correlations masquerading as a path analysis, um, where greater family conflict at age seven is predicting earlier age of menarche, and as is father absence down here, as well as weight, greater weight. Um, now, by 2004, oh, let me just say one other thing. Um, this type 1 and type 2 here that we call a quantity and quality <coughs> reproductive strategy. How many care for them poorly, and that's both relationships and children, versus have few and care for them intensely. <coughs> were actually first described in the initial submission of the article as R on the left and K on the right strategies. The reviews we got back said, nobody believes in R and K strategy. And so we were forced to abandon that terminology, which intrigues me because that terminology is running around again. Um, okay, so by 2004, enough data had emerged that Bruce Ellis proceeded to review it in a masterful article on the timing of pubertal maturation in girls with an integrated life history approach. And among many, many other things, Bruce made the following comment. Psychosocial acceler acceleration theory, as he came to describe this evolutionary theory of socialization posits that warm, cohesive family environments slow down pubertal development, whereas dangerous or conflictual ones accelerate it. Empirical re research to date has provided reasonable, though incomplete, support for the theory. On the one hand, there is converging evidence from a number of methodologically sound studies that greater parent-child warmth and cohesion, this should be R instead of is, are associated with later pubertal development. This research also suggests that greater frequency of parent-child interaction predicts later puberty. On the other hand, the proposed accelerating effect of parent-child conflict on coercion on pubertal development is yet to be clearly established. <coughs> I don't think I filled in a piece here. I'm too close to these data. The basic argument was that under conditions of adversity, the future is precarious. If the future is precarious, what I learned from evolutionary thinking was that reproduction and passing on one's genes is what the game of life is all about. That's the currency of the realm. So under conditions of adversity, if you're at risk of dying before you reproduce, what should you do? Run faster to reproduce. And thus you should reproduce earlier. Whereas if the conditions and the environment support well-being broadly conceived, then one should grow more slowly, literally and figuratively, embody the resources surrounding you that are accessible to you and available to you, be they economic, social, education, or nutritional, defer maturation so that you're more robust, you're healthier, you're stronger, you're a better catch in the mating market, you mate with somebody with better genetic potential and better resources, and you ultimately enhance your reproductive fitness. That's the underlying thinking going on here, which led to the puberty prediction, that risk would be associated with earlier maturation. In the time since Bruce's 2004 review of the literature, any number of studies have now emerged that at the very least are not inconsistent with our the theoretical finding. Here's a piece, and many of these came from studies, at least initially, that were not <coughs> about this subject. So here's data on pubertal maturation associated with the development of alcohol use and abuse, in which a group of investigators studied 1,420 children from a representative sample of 4,500 9, 11, 13-year-olds in Western North Carolina. The children reported on breast and pubic hair development using schematic rate drawings, which were then scaled according to Tanner staging. Um, and it, and then kids were classified as being early maturers or other, 30% classified as early maturers, meeting stage four pubertal development, stage five, and it's all over and done with. 
By age 13, 14% of the sample had been maltreated according to their own parental report. And lo and behold, consistent with our thinking, the maltreated children were maturing about a half a year earlier than the non-maltreated children. This is just what the theory would have predicted, or did predict. Other work has reported much the same, linking sexual abuse with earlier age of menarche, earlier first sexual relationship, greater <coughs> desire to have children, and age of first childbirth, as well as sexual and physical abuse being associated with early menarche. So these are more kind of general replication studies linking extreme adversity in the form of maltreatment, sexual or physical, with accelerated development. Um, Bruce Ellis then took advantage of data available from Marilyn Essex, long-running longitudinal study, which was originally designed to study the effects of early maternal employment, to look at whether or not these processes are operative and whether or not one could actually link what's always been missing from my thinking, which is what are the biological mechanisms? How does what's out there get what we now talk about as biologically embedded? Not being a, bio a, micro bi a molecular process-oriented biologist, I don't really have much of a clue on these subjects. What I had was a big picture view, not uh, a small, not a refined view of what might be going on. So Bruce reasoned that maybe we can pick up these effects early in the pubertal development process by looking at um, adrenarche, and so studied 180 girls out of original 570, followed in the Wisconsin study of families and work. And in particular, they, measured, they took measurements of salivary DHEA, and with those, when children were about eight years of age, were able to classify, as well as sec secondary sexual characteristics, were able to classify some children as pre-adrenarchial, and thus later maturing, and others as adrenarchial and early maturing, um, based upon these repeated measurements of DHEA in the saliva. And here's what they found. They found that, and so what we're looking at here, are differences between the not yet matured and the matured. And what we see is the, mature, the not yet matured have more parent parental supportiveness. And these are measured in the preschool years, around four years of age. And what does that mean? They have warmer parenting, more positive emotional climate, more authoritative, democratic style of parenting. But importantly, and this is the negative part, less parental negativity. There was also a difference in paternal supportiveness, as well as in father's report of marital conflict and depression, all in line with the thinking. So now we've got experience affecting, apparently, or we're going to interpret it causally, as affecting adrenarche, which is really the first <coughs> in the ground stage of pubertal development, with the biological marker for it. As you can see, there's also a relationship between these preschool family environment measures and two years and fifth grade secondary sexual characteristics. That's about when kids are nine or ten years of age. I say that, I mean, you all know that, but I forget, I was in London for 12 years, and one of the things I'm struck by now when I read the American, mostly American literature, is how, how naive we are in thinking that when we say fifth grade, everybody around the world is going to know what that means or how old kids are. Um, I don't think, well, I'm talking to the converted here, you're anthropologists, you know this stuff. We developmentalists are slow on the uptake. Um, and here's the same data in Bruce's Marilyn Essex study cast in more path-analytic terms. Now, importantly, in this work, as I should have said earlier, we're controlling for mother, they're controlling for mother's age of menarche as an attempt to control or take into account heritability, at least on the mother's side. And so what you see is poorer SES, lower SES, being related to earlier pubertal development, greater marital conflict being related to early pubertal development by way of greater um, BMI, which is what we also theorized would happen, and also just parental supportiveness, which is related to marital conflict, also being related to pubertal development, such that the more supportive, the more harmonious, the more optimal, quote, positive your home environment is, the later you're maturing. Um, I took advantage of data that we had collected as part of a large-scale study of childcare um, to ask a similar question about family rearing antecedents of pubertal timing. Here we had 410 white girls participating in what was known as the NICHD study of early child care and youth development. Um, what's going to be important here is maternal harsh control measured at 54 months. 
which tapped into spank child for doing something wrong, expect the child to obey without asking questions, expect the child to be quiet and respectful <coughs> when adults were around, believe, praise, spoil the child, providing few hugs and kisses. This is, seems less supportive, less sensitive, more harsh, certainly, quote, in, in the terminology of my development of brethren, less optimal parenting. And we had physical exams in the children, but most importantly for this presentation, girls' reports of their age of first puberty, because we measured these girls' development at 9 half, 10 and a half, 11 and a half, and 12 and a half years of age. Um, as we expected, mother's age of menarche um, was correlated with both girls' and reported age of menarche and measured pubertal onset. So like in the Ellis and Essex work, we partially this out in attempt to control for some of the biological inheritance. Um, Girls who experienced menarche at an earlier age, when they ex girls experienced menarche, we found at an earlier age, when they experienced greater maternal harshness at 54 months of age, preschool, this is just like the Ellis and Essex, and in grades one and three. I don't like the finding from grades one and three because by then some of these girls have already moved through adrenarche um, and maybe even on their way to puberty. So I think the fact that we're detecting these effects as early as 54 months is important, these environmental correlates, um, statistical effects, whether they're causal or not is another question, which I'll get to shortly. But we wanted to ask the question that was central to our thinking about reproductive strategy. Okay, it's one thing for what I call the uncanny prediction of developmental antecedent rearing experiences and environmental exposures to predict pubertal timing, as I've been showing you. But the whole idea was that this was a means to an end <coughs> about reproductive behavior. So the question became, would we be able to predict a process whereby we'd affect sexual risk taking and perhaps other risk taking as well? You think of drug, sex, and rock and roll? Well, sexual risk taking was asking 15 years old about their sexual behavior, oral sex, vaginal sex, been diagnosed with an STD or had been pregnant. Other risk taking was tobacco, alcohol, other drugs. And these are the results we detected in a path analysis, which goes, as we've already reported, having residualized child's age in menarche for the effect of mother's age, that earlier harshness, more harshness predicted earlier age in menarche, which itself predicts earlier sexual risk taking, but not intriguingly, at least to a significant extent, other risk taking. Although other risk taking is predicted by more maternal harshness, just as much socialization theory would predict. So here we see evidence, or at least correlational, longitudinal perspective evidence, not necessarily causal, that the developmental pathway we originally theorized seems to be operate, operative from early developmental rearing experience to pubertal timing and thereby to reproductive, i.e. sexual behavior. But then we asked ourselves, this is, that was four and a half years of age just like the Ellis and, and, and Essex work. What about earlier in life? Could we get measurements of development and early environmental exposures earlier? Well, if you go back to this framework, one of the things I did when I established it was reinterpret attachment theory. And because attachment theory, the notion is that insecure attachments, which generate or are all about mistrustful or internal working models of self and other, really are going to affect this kind of stuff down here. Well, in the NICHD study of early child care and development, we had measures of attachment security at 15 months of age. Now, there's good correlational and experimental, truly causal evidence, that attachment security is at least partly a function of the quality of the environment that the child grows up in, which is insensitive care predicts insecure attachment, sensitive supportive care predicts secure attachment. So we took early attachment as a marker of where I am in development at 15 months of age, in part as a function of my rearing experience, and asked, can you go from 15 months of age to pubertal timing? And it turns out you can. Because what we found using our age of, uh, using our um, timing of pubertal development, these were, I didn't talk about this much yet, but at 9 and a half, 10 and a half, 11 and a half, and 12 and a half, we had, the gir we had girls, and the boys, by the way, Study uh, measured by either nurse practitioners, endocrinologists, or pediatricians who were counter staging these kids. And what we see here is that insecure infants had an earlier pubertal onset. Earlier onset is defined by before 10 and a half years of age, they were already starting to mature. And they also had 
in earlier pubertal completion, which means that by 13 and a half years of age, <coughs> they were done maturing. So the, the, the kids who was infants, as 15 month olds, were insecure, and we have every reason to believe that they were receiving less sensitive care, started puberty earlier and ended puberty earlier. So as I've written to my developmental brethren, not that it's had any impact upon them at what, whatsoever, is this cause for a reconsideration of what early attachment is all about. And I think it's about, and Jim Chisholm has written about this thoughtfully as well, about the regulation of reproductive strategy. Now what's ironic is that Bowlby, after Darwin, was probably our first evolutionary psychologist. Bowlby's very theory of attachment, which every student of developmental psychology, and certainly every um, member of the developmental of, of the attachment mafia and attachment theory, you know, devotee knows, argued that attachment behavior evolved because the argument goes: infants who stayed close and whose whose calls to mothers and caregivers brought them close were more likely to survive and reproduce. When those babies who did not display attachment behavior wandered off, got gobbled up by predators, fell into fires, or whatever it was, didn't pass on their genes. And so, according to um, Bowlby's theory, that's why we have an attachment system. It's evolved. And that's where evolutionary biology begins and ends in the study of developmental psychology for the most part, and certainly <coughs> begins and ends in the study of attachment. And so what I proposed a number of years ago is that, no, attachment's really about something more fundamental in evolution and biological, and I think here we have evidence that at least suggests that argument isn't all wrong. And again, not that it has had any impact on my colleagues who study attachment. Well, now we come to the crux of the matter, which is, is, as some people, like my original colleague and friend now, Timmy Moffat, said, this is all a behavior genetic masquerade. We don't have really environmental regulation <coughs> of development in the service of reproductive fitness goals, but rather we have shared genes, and we have some people who, are, who have genes to make them lousy parents and absent fathers and mature early, and we have other people who have, whose genes lead them to be other, <coughs> do otherwise. Well, David Rowe, now deceased, who to me was the only person I knew who studied molecular, I would say there, there, there are two um, biologies in psychology. There's the molecular genetic biology, or, or two evolutionary perspectives, or, Darwinian, or masquerading as Darwinian perspectives. There's the behavior genetic folks who study molecular genetics and heritability, who for the most part say nothing about adaptation, function, and Darwin, although they always show him you know, a picture of him because they want to be tied to him. But they're really Mendelians. They're not Darwinians. And then you have what I think of as the evolutionary psychologists and anthropologists, for the most part, at least classically, were Darwinians, but not Mendelians, although there was an assumption that Mendel and things are running around there someplace. Well, David Rowe was one of the few people years ago who worked from both schools of thought. And David, I always found, was made appreciative critiques of my thinking because he favored the behavioral genetic perspective that this was all a behavior genetic heritable masquerade, but he realized this was an empirical question. But his thinking and his challenges got me thinking. Um, oh, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself here. Well, anyway, to address this issue, Tither and Ellis have recently evaluated whether exposure to father absence and <coughs> the dysfunctional father related to age and menarche using a sibling design. They basically argued that if we want to get at this issue, Let's look at two girls in the same family when the father leaves. And the younger daughter, who shares the same environment, roughly, but not exactly, but the same gene pool compared to others, the younger daughter has been exposed to more father absence than the older daughter because the father left after the older daughter had grown up with him for a longer time than the younger daughter. So he predicted, so they predicted, you will see this father absence effect in younger daughters when father leaves, not older daughters. And this is exactly what they found in terms of monarchial age. As you see on the bottom right, those are the younger sisters with biologically disrupted families. They're the ones who are maturing earlier. The older daughters who had more exposure to the father and had less father absence experience are more or less developing at the same time as the biologically intact families. So this speaks to, this doesn't look like it's all a heritable masquerade. I mean, it doesn't discount that entirely. 
But then, importantly, Pither and Ellis went further and said, is it father absence or is the kind of father I have and thereby the relationships girls have with their fathers? So they were finding analysis predicting that that effect at the bottom right is really being a function of poor father-daughter relationships. And that will be demarcated by troubled fathers, men who are behaviorally disordered or emotionally disordered in some manner, shape, or form. Oops. And that's exactly what they found. That it was really the younger daughters whose fathers left and whose fathers were seriously dysfunctional, suggesting that there's a relational or psychological or experiential dynamic here, um, not just a social address <laughs> of father absence. So that was one of the studies that is tolerably genetically informed that points in the direction that this isn't just a heritable um, process we're looking at and misinterpreting. Well, then along came Pasonin, who decided to take advantage of the separations that took place um, in Finland during World War II when some children were evacuated from their families at young ages and sent to live um, in Sweden with temporary foster care families and people growing up in the same neighborhoods, the same age, who weren't so sent for whatever reasons. Um, actually, it's it it Sweden and Denmark. So the question became, did the children who were separated and therefore experience stress, perhaps even what they talk about as trauma early in life, are they going to develop differently than their cohort mates who did not have that exposure? And lo and behold, that's what they found. Former child evacuees had earlier age of menarche, earlier first childbirth, the men, more children by late adulthood, the women, and shorter interbirth intervals than non-separated children. Now, of course, what's really fascinating here is not just the menarchial finding, but the finding about more children. <laughs> then we have the first evidence that there might, even in this day and age, i.e. the modern era, be the very reprodu reproductive fitness differences um, that were hypothesized, that this is a quantity strategy. You're speeding up menarche, you're going to have more children, which doesn't necessarily mean you're going to care for them more intensively, but you're in a risky environment, or you perceive it that way. OK, I want to call your attention right now to the notion that these effect sizes are small, indisputably. But does this matter? Now, some people want to dismiss things because effect sizes are small. I want to point out, highlight three points for consideration. The first is the secular trend in pubertal timing, which will be no news to people in this room. And what it suggests to me is that a lot of the variability in pubertal timing has already been squeezed out. So what we may be detecting is an evolutionary mechanism that only has so much room to manifest itself in this day and age, whereas way back when, these rearing environments might have had a much larger effect on the time <coughs> of puberty, before so much variance had been squeezed out by the secular trend. The second is, and this is really important when it comes to thinking about effect sizes in any field, is what are the functional consequences of the small effect? So often we think that it has to be a big effect for it to matter. Well, Bruce Ellis elegantly points out that in the case of pubertal development, this is not the case. Although the size of the correlations between family environments and timing of puberty are generally small, these effects may nonetheless have important ramifications. The time from menarche until 50% of menstrual cycles are ovulatory is approximately one year if menarche before, occurs before age 12, and four and a half years if menarchial age is 13 or older. Thus, even small effects of family environment on timing of puberty may have substantial effects of on timing of onset of reproductive status. If you're 12 and you're menarchial, in a year, you'll be fertile. If you're 13 or older, it's going to take, apparently, much longer for you to be fertile. So this small difference in few months, maybe, because they average four to six months of what we're predicting, who knows what they were in a natural, you know, in a more aboriginal EEA-like environment, <coughs> are of functional importance. So the fact that they're small, we're only shaving off a few months, may not be as unimportant as some people might be inclined to believe. The final thing I want to consider, and it goes back to that David Rowe proposition, is differential susceptibility. 
Another idea that I come to as a developmentalist, untrained in evolutionary biology, by putting on evolutionary lenses and seeing the world, I think, in color rather than black and white. And that is that, let's put it this way. Here's the Darwinian challenge. Why not have, would natural selection craft an organism whose future functioning is influenced by its earlier experiences? That's central, that's the central dogma of those of us who are nurturists and developmentalists. That what goes on early in life affects what happens later, be that an hour later, five years later, or 50 years later. But the future is inherently uncertain. So preparation for tomorrow, based on experience today, could be fundamentally misguided if the world changes. And I always point out to non-Darwinian audiences who don't understand this, the killing fields of Cambodia. Who did the Khmer Rouge murder first? They murdered people like us. Wearing spectacles, having uncalloused hands, because they took that as a sign that you were educated. They didn't want educated people. So now go back a generation and think of all those parents who persuaded, cajoled, encouraged their children to study hard and work hard in, in school and so they could get jobs. Just like my father argued who ran a restaurant so you wouldn't have to stand on your feet all day. Or you wouldn't have to stand in the, under the burning sun you know, in the field and you could get a job in an office and sit on your butt like the rest of us here. Well, the kids who got with that program who were susceptible to that tuition, literally and figuratively, were less likely to live to breed another day. But their compatriots who couldn't get with the program, who weren't susceptible to that tuition, who weren't affected by those early encouragements, were more likely to survive and breed. In other words, the future turned out very different than what those parents encouraging their children to study hard could have imagined. So this says to me that nature should have hedged its bets, and we should have variation in susceptibility to rearing experiences or other developmental and environmental exposure. Um, and if that's the case, then maybe one of the reasons we get small effects is because we haven't sorted out the susceptible from the unsusceptible. And I articulated this view back in 2000 in response to some of that David Rowe thinking I was mentioning by highlighting the possible distinction, which I wasn't familiar with until <coughs> David Rowe, um, got me thinking about it, conditional and alternative reproductive strategies. That maybe the Belsky, Steinberg, and Draper psychosocial acceleration theory of socialization is really a conditional theory that applies to some, not all. That is, some of us are susceptible to having our reproductive strategy environmentally regulated. Others of us are alternative strategists. We're either fast developers or slow developers or in-between developers, but that's not a function of our environmental environment and developmental and environmental regulation, just a function of a fixed strategy. For people who don't understand conditional and alternative strategies, I often make the highlight the difference between equities and bonds when it comes to investing. A bond invested for 30 years at 3% pays 30% for 30 years no matter what happens to inflation. It may be a good investment, it may be a bad investment. One invested for 15% for 30 years could turn, it sounds like a great investment, but it could turn out to be a lousy investment if we get 30% inflation. But that's what it's going to be. It's a fixed strategy. In contrast, equities go up and down, not based on things necessarily historically, but the current you know, economic climate and how a business is doing. So a conditional strategy is one in which the future is determined, if you would, and regulated by experiences in the past. An alternative strategy is one in which future functioning is not subject to that much or that kind of contextual regulation. Well, as it turns out, in 2011, three paper, two papers came out, one of which I'll be sharing three papers, one of which we just replicated, one paper we just replicated, addressing this very issue. And two of them had to do with the estrogen receptor gene as a moderator of environmental effects on pubertal thyroid. The other had to do with physiological reactivity as being marker of plasticity and regulating the effect of environmental effects on pubertal timing. Here are the results of the first study from Steve Mannix group in Pittsburgh in which they theorized, based on our thinking, that carriers of the GG, homozygous with the GG um, allele on the estrogen receptor gene would be susceptible to the environmental influences on age of medicine, <coughs> those carrying the double homozygous for the A allele would not be, and the AG would be, the homozygous would be in between. Now this was a sample 
of women enrolled in a study in middle age about breast cancer. But they happen to include in the measurement battery information on when you had the first period because of established data linking age of puberty and breast cancer and other health risks. But they also, for reasons that aren't clear, gathered data on retrospective reports of environmental experience, the quality of the family environment. And lo and behold, they found this gene-environment interaction just like I had, if you would, theoretically anticipated with the notion of differential susceptibility. What's important here is we don't see, well, these look like fixed strategies. Your age of marriage is not a function of the quality of your family environment. These look like strongly plastic strategies. It is. But we also see what I would call a gradient of plasticity here with the heterozygotes looking somewhere in between. Well, the limitations acknowledged by Maddox's group were that they didn't control for any heritability. They had retrospective reports of age of menarche, which actually turned out to be fairly accurate, but nevertheless are imperfect. And they had retrospective reports of the early family environment, which we know are subject to recall bias, in part because people in very adverse environments sometimes don't remember them or can't recall them. So I said, let's go into that NICHD early child care database, and let's take our DNA and get it assayed for this particular polymorphism. In fact, there were two estrogen receptor genes that showed exactly the same thing. And let's see if we can replicate this interaction more or less using the measure, which you've already talked about, maternal sensitivity, observationally assessed at 6, 15, 24, and 36 months, predicting age of menarche prospectively, controlling for mother's age of menarche. And lo and behold, we more or less to a degree, replicated what Manic found, because here are our GGs. <coughs> They're being affected. Here are the others, being affected less. So it looks like we have, relatively speaking, conditional and alternative strategies here in two different studies. Now, anybody who's following or has any awareness in the G by E literature, especially in psychiatric genetics, knows that there are a lot of questions about it, and everybody's calling for replication. Well, here we've got I think, surprisingly, replication is replication on both, both polymorphisms. Now, Bruce Ellis and Tom Boyce looked at this issue a different way going to Marilyn Essex's work because they had a theory that it wasn't necessarily only genes that moderated environmental effects. It wasn't only genes that were markers for whether or not you were fixed or malleable strategist, but their physiological reactivity also was an indicator of such. More specifically, in their biological sensitivity to context theory, that the highly physiologically reactive would be more susceptible to rearing effects. And that's exactly what they find here in Marilyn Essex data when you're looking at rate of pubertal development. And what they're finding is, for those who the solid lines, low SNS reactivity, okay, in the, um, here you get no real effect of the environment. But what you get here is these are low support, low environmental support, high reactive, and guess what? They're maturing at a faster rate than the others. When you take the same high SNS reactivity, but who've got high family support, we've seen those measures earlier, they're maturing at a slower rate. Now, one of the interesting questions that arises here, you might say, is does the estrogen receptor gene have anything to do with physiological reactivity? I don't know. But in both cases, what we see is maybe one of the reasons we get small effects is because <coughs> we're averaging these effects together and not appreciating the fact that individuals are differentially susceptible. And I got to thinking about individuals different, differentially susceptible, um, which for reasons that make me, uh, that are unclear, has not been a basic idea in my field of dominant psychology for the last 30 years. I got there by putting on evolutionary lenses and thinking about natural selection and appreciating that the future is uncertain, therefore we all shouldn't be equally susceptible. One more piece of evidence for my brethren who don't buy it, who don't embrace it, that looking at the world from an evolutionary mindset has empirical benefits. Now, what about mechanisms of influence? By what physiological mechanisms beyond adrenaline might rearing experience, including insecurity-inducing, insensitive mothering, and maternal harsh control come to regulate reproductive biological development and thereby reproductive strategy. 
We speculated that a neuroendocrine subsystem intertwined with other endocrine subsystems could provide a pathway linking experience in the family of cubital timing. That was just a general comment, a general idea. More recently, and this is when I wrote this, Chisholm and Associates theorized that the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis in particular, which is directly involved in stress regulation, may play a critical role in the process. Well, the elegant experimental research with rats by Cameron and Associates, that's Michael Meany's work, showed not only that maternal licking and grooming of the newborn pup enhances stress regulation, delays the onset of puberty, and reduces sexual activity, with the reverse being true of its absence, but that such effects on rat reproductive strategy are mediated by maternal care effects on gene expression via methylation. In fact, what I would argue is what's going on here is that what makes these guys plastic malleable strategists, conditional strategists, is that they're susceptible to epigenetic regulation. And so the environments affecting the expression of their genes and thereby regulating pubertal development, and that these guys are not. And in fact, with that thinking in mind, I said to Michael Meany one day, Michael, and I think his work is, you know, as elegant as it gets. I remember reading it for the first time and thinking, we're doing 22nd century science here in the first part of the 20th century, for 21st century. This is amazing. You know, reading about unwrapping chromatin and, you know, methylation. I mean, this was really, and, and reading about it in clear writing was really eye-opening for me. And I said, is it possible, Michael, that maybe one of the reasons you get this lovely cascade of maternal behavior, licking and grooming, affecting gene expressing, affecting stress regulation, and thereby and so forth, is because you're dealing with a highly malleable strain of rat. You know, these rats are all clones. They're, they're, they're genetically identical. And if you had done a different rat, you wouldn't have got this. And Michael said to me, you know, Jay, it's interesting, because I have a colleague who can't replicate my results, and he's got a different strain of rat, i.e., does he have this strain of rat? And so if Mimi had studied two rat strains, would he also have found a G by E interaction, such that the epigenetic mechanism that has made him famous among developmentalists is really going on here, but it's not going on here. And indeed, one of the things that drives me crazy about my developmental brethren at Grigan um, is that they love me. They love the notion that the environment will regulate gene expression. And I like the idea that genes become dependent variables as opposed to first causes. But what they don't seem to take on board at all is that what Meany has basically studied is reproductive strategy development. Because it's not just that maternal licking and grooming in the rat affects gene expression, which it surely does, and that that affects stress regulation processes, but that that affects pubertal development. And that affects sexual behavior. And that affects how those grown children, those grown up rats, treat their own babies. And in fact, I was shocked, almost out of my seat, about half a dozen years ago, at the major meeting of the Society for Research and Child Development, which is the developmental psychology sort of get together, when Michael Meany gave a talk. And he started by putting up the Belsky Steinberg Draper model, and then interpreted all his data within that. So I think here we've got a very elegant animal model of exactly what I've been talking about. And I'll end there. Thank you. So thank you, Jay, for stimulating. Um, uh, it strikes me that an important consideration, which you kind of alluded to with the killing field reference, um, is the, the time scale of environmental change, right? So um, uh, early calibration during development in anticipation of the adult environment assumes that the environment won't change between childhood and adulthood, which is a plausible bet in many environments, right? Um, you can actually stretch that out. Um, so you can say, well, environments may be intergenerationally stable. And when you do that, then while well, I think it's perfectly reasonable that the gambit um, uh, that Bruce and other people have taken of controlling for maternal age of anarchy as a way of controlling for um, uh, heritability. heritability the way that the behavioral genetics yeah. want to talk about it, that's a conservative strategy. Because yeah. what could well be going on is that there's genomic imprinting where yep. mom you know, went through the Dutch famine or whatever it is, okay? And yep. so mom said, 
this is a good bet for you know yeah. two or three generations yep. down the road. So we'll have what looks like heritability in a yep. behavioral genetic sense, um, uh, but it is in fact a facultative adaptation. Absolutely, I, I I couldn't agree more. And I love the work of um, Kazawa on phenotypic uh, inertia, in which he points that out about that, that you know fetal growth is determined by your grandmother's growth as a fetus in her great in your great grandmother's womb. So I think that's eminently eminently plausible, and, and certainly so. I, I couldn't agree more. I think um, you know it's hard enough to get my developmental brethren to swallow this. <laughs> Getting them to go there is you know that's that's for the time being bridge too far. But yes. A little louder, please. Sorry, just a question about some of the studies from the beginning that are just so far. Surveys, were those controlled for things like income of the parents or Okay, question. Were they controlled for punitive confounders, like income of the parents? I don't actually, I'm forever, as a reviewer, criticizing studies that are interested in rearing effects and control for those broader contextual factors. Why? Because there's plenty of theory of e and evidence that those contextual factors themselves regulate the rearing effects and thereby the downstream consequences if you think about it in causal terms. So I think there's an inherent problem with essentially <coughs> taking away the parenting or the rearing variants by controlling for these things when what, remember, the developing organism doesn't necessarily experience the violence in the neighborhood or the lower social class status, or the occupational lack of prestige. What it experiences is the proximate experience of how my parents are affecting me, or treating me. If how my parents are treating me is affected by those things, and now we're going back you know, to classic anthropological work of, and I'm blocking on their names, the five culture studies, the Harvard people. Whiting and Child. Whiting and Child, you know. Um, then you're really sort of upsetting the very system of causation. So rather, I would rather see, instead of controlling for this, and actually if you look at my original slide, it's implied is that these distal factors regulate and influence these proximal factors like rearing and thereby the child. And if you want to put that story together, I think you can, but controlling for them, I would argue, actually disrupts the story. It'd be kind of like, this, is my, this would be my analogy. Why is there light here? Well, my theory says it's because there are electrons flowing through the wire I can't see. Oh, but that's confounded with the light switch. So let's turn the light switch off and see do we still get, you know, we want to control for which position the light switch is on. That doesn't make any sense because the light switch is, is, is part of a system of causation. The light switch regulates the flow of electrons. That's my parenting, my rearing environment. That's the social class. So. I, I, I'd be adverse to control. I, I think controlling for these factors misconstrues the system of causation. Not everybody buys that, but that's my argument. Yeah. Um, in the studies you reviewed, uh, is it the case that even at the low end of rearing uh, environment quality, there's typically still enough food? And right. The question is, yeah. then, if there's in, when the environment is, is even worse than that, so there's not something which would have likely been the case among our ancestors very commonly. There actually yeah. isn't enough. Then is maturation not speeded up? Right. Because there aren't the somatic resources. Right. You know, Bruce Ellis in his 2004 masterful piece addressed this issue, um, and it was one that we mentioned clearly, but in passing in the 91 <coughs> paper, which is what we probably have is a curvilinear process, so that. And from a life history perspective, you would expect that. That when conditions are so bad that they actually threaten survival, you shut down growth and development, you concentrate on just living. So I don't think so we don't have that in our sample. We're not dealing with starvation and that kind of thing. So um, I and in fact, this is also I make this point also when people point out, well, wait a minute. You're saying adversity accelerates development and lowers the age of puberty. But but look at the secular trend. The age of puberty has come down while the world has gotten more affluent. How do you put those two together? Well, I'm not exactly sure, to be honest, but my get-out-of-jail-free card says, why do we only have one mechanism regulating the timing of puberty? We could have multiple mechanisms regulating the timing of puberty. Um, and these two mechanisms may not be incompatible. Um, secondly, and correct me if I'm wrong here, 
It's my understanding that most people interpret the secular trend as being a function of enhanced health and nutrition. But I'm not sure there's any other than observational sort of interpretive data to that effect. And I've always wondered about an alternative, which is the other thing that's happened <coughs> over this period of time, is we spend more and more time and are exposed to more and more strangers, people who aren't kin and blood relatives. And is it possible that that's a signal to us of some sort that we process by speeding up development? I don't know if that's for certain. I am just struck by, you see the secular trend, that's caused by health and nutrition, end of story. Well, that's not the only thing changing over time. So, um, you know, I share those observations, not as anything definitive, but just, you know, they're, they're ideas that run around in my mind. Yes? I have one pretty quick question and then a more broad question, but the quick one is that, and both of them are about sort of cross-cultural tests of this, which are, as you mentioned, lacking. Um, so the first comes to your discussion about small effect sizes, and if what you're saying about secular trends squeezing out the variation is true, then would you think that we would actually expect larger effect sizes in small-scale societies, for example, that haven't gone through these kinds of um, Quite conceivably as long as we take into consideration this point right. about, you know, are you in a precarious survival situation? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And so this, the second one also sort of builds off of what Joan was saying, but um, comes back to, well, I wrote it down in terms of, of that original figure that you have with the ABC, yeah. DE, right? So I'm thinking specifically about father absence effects, which is something I've yeah. thought about more, but I was happy to see actually that you had so much in there about maternal harshness and things like that. So um, if, um, if father absence is actually going to be affecting D, this somatic development, yeah. right, it's dependent on paternal investment actually being important to A, B, and C, right? Um, so, perhaps. Uh, uh, let me just begin by saying, we had, I had an interesting conversation about this earlier today already, which is that First, that as a student of Yuri Brafenbrenner, I always looked at the father absence, <coughs> Draper and Harpenden idea, as much too narrow and just a social address. Um, and that really what mattered was ecological stress, father absence just being one of many markers of it. Now, Bruce Ellis, more in the Draper and Harpenden tradition, has argued no, and the way I put it is, there's something that privileges the role of father. And it's not that all ecological stressors aren't created equal. That there's, you know, the girls in particular, their minds have evolved to detect, um, that detect father presence because that's a marker of paternal investment and that's a marker of risk and that kind of thing. Right. So. But that's but that's in, in Western industrialized societies. That's true, right? In other places, there's a lot, there's a lot of variation in that. The same way that there's variation in maternal investment if we're in a cooperatively breeding yeah, species, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. then the presence of right. other people right. in general may affect things about this kind of mother and kid's attachment. Well, I think this is where you end up getting back here. And, and really the issue is, in a cult, what is your, this is where, you know, this is where I am a psychologist and I'm a psychologist of children, which is what is their experience of the proximate rearing environment? If my father's not there and my mother's not there, but there's lots of kin and I'm getting a lot of nurturance and support, what difference does it make? If they are there and I'm not getting any nurturance and support, you know, that's what matters. So, so really, I think of this as being the proximate nutrient shaping this. And that these other factors are simply probabilistic determinants of that. No, I, I, I agree with you, but I'm, that's why I'm saying I think with these, if you were to go out and sort of follow in the Pat Draper, yeah. go out and go and bring this other perspective in, right, that you, these kind of typical measures that we've used about father presence, father absence, mother, yeah, maternal right. harshness, things like that, they may not work. Well, and you this is, take those exactly, that, you wouldn't that, expect them to. Well, right, I, I, and that's why, if, you, if in fact, if you went through the studies that I've cited here and elsewhere, you know, that there are a plethora of indicators of the rearing context. Father absence, maternal supportiveness, um, child rearing attitudes, sexual abuse. To me, and, and a lot of people get upset by this. They don't like it. 
you know, is it this or is it that? I said, wait a minute. What we've got here is the notion that these are things that affect the child's immediate psychological experience. <coughs> and that can come from a lot of different ways. Um, and that gets measured in a lot of different ways, depending on what a person's devoted to in their studies. And most of these studies didn't start out as studies of an evolutionary theory of socialization. They're opportunistic attempts to take advantage of it. But I couldn't agree more. I think, in that sense, what you're really saying is you need to know the local ecology to know what are the indicators of what investment is, is coming through that that child might be detecting and sensing. Um, and I would add to that, now I also need to know to what extent the child is sensitive to those indicators, or it's just water over duck's back. Yeah. I, I just want to briefly address your speculation about the secular trend. So um, uh, this general life history perspective says, well, there's a trade-off between growth and reproduction. Um, so earlier maturation comes at the expense of growth. And um, uh, consistent with that, all else being equal, um, adult stature um, it, it is reduced by earlier maturation. But w what we see with a secular trend is that um, maturation getting... occurs earlier and adult stature uh, increases. Right. So, so that suggests that it is the, the health and nutrition explanation and not um, the facultative adjustment. OK, yeah. I, I don't have a, I don't. And it also suggests to me that there are multiple mechanisms at work here um, going on. I, 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 and I, I don't think you know that's a problem. I can eat lots of good food. I can eat lots of protein and I don't eat muscle, but I can eat lots of you know lousy food and that's going to make fat. And I end up both looking at one. You know, if you're only measuring my muscle, hey, I'm healthy. If you're measuring my fat, I'm unhealthy. You know, if we have a simple-minded notion of health that it's one thing shaped by in one direction by what we consume, we're not going to understand that. Another question, yeah. Um, I don't know much about the SR1 receptor, but it seems like a likely candidate for um, many pleiotropies. There could be many reasons why there's variability there that have nothing to do with um, having alternate developmental strategies. Um, to um, decide that, you might ask, what is the frequency of these alleles and the genotypes in the population? Is that in the, the paper you said? No, no, it's not. But I would point this out relative to something that was said earlier. And this hypothesis I have that, that let's imagine there are plasticity genes. There are genes that make us more and less susceptible to the environment. Um, and when you say, do we know what the frequency of those are in the population, it suggests that there's one frequency in every population. I mean, I never understood population genetics until I started thinking about this. And it occurred to me there must be places <coughs> in the world where the relationship between today and tomorrow, previous generation and next generation, over historical time, has been greater and less. To me, it only makes sense to have developmental plasticity if there's a tolerable association between today and tomorrow. So might we observe that in ecological niches in which there's been less stability of the environment, there's been less predictability over time, we should get population genetic differences um, than in those in which there's been a reasonable amount of stability. Now, if there's too much stability, why build in developmental plasticity? Things should go to fixation. So this gets me thinking about the possibility that actually what we should be thinking about is that there are actually population genetic differences across population in their susceptibility to these kind of environmental processes. Um, because if life is stochastic, why adjust tomorrow's development by what's going on today, fool's errand. If life is perfectly predictable, why not just create fixed strategists who are going to be optimally suited and you know, assimilate, you know, we get a Baldwin, a Baldwin effect here. It's only where that, where the tomorrow is tolerably predictable but not too highly predictable that I think it makes sense we should have variation in susceptibility to environment. And I'm presuming, at least in the world I live in, that's more true than less true. Is that, you see what I'm saying? Um, yes. Uh, to the developmental psychologist, type 2 is good and type 1 yeah, is Yeah, optimal and not optimal. Um, but do you think that in today's world in America, the type 2 strategy is actually not working as well as far as lifetime reproductive success? And 
Yeah, I mean, this is the, I mean, this is really the question about um, the demographic transition, isn't it? You know, we're having fewer kids and that kind of thing. And um, again, I, I abandon, you know, maybe all too simple-minded evolutionary thinking because I'm a latecomer to it. It's all I can um, comprehend um, hesitantly. And so I start to think and wonder, well, why do you have fewer children? Well, the first reason you have fewer children is because it takes fewer children to get the same number of grandchildren. And that's why, to me, we discover, we find that what reduces family size almost better than anything else? You educate women. That gives them more control over their destiny, which means their children are placed in a less precarious position, so they don't have to have as many of them. They can care for them, protect them, resource them. Um, <coughs> so the demographic transition, to me, is a logical response to that. Now, what happens when we get more and more wealth and we're still having fewer children? Well, I can't help wonder, do our old brains know something that our frontal lobes don't? Which is, and 9-11 taught me this, is life is more precarious and civilization is more precarious than we imagine. Um, and it may be what we have an appreciation of, and this is pushing it, I understand, is that I have, it's almost like I'm an organism that has to make an egg with a lot of surrounding nutritional material because there's going to be risk out there. And so I'm going to have fewer children on a mass, more wealth, because when, you know, the world goes to hell in a handbasket, you know, it, my gated community is not going to be enough. I'm going to have to be able to buy an island. I'm going to have to be able to get a whole lot of man guards. And not that these things are all sort of through, but at some level, are we feeling and hearing things in our bodies, in our old brains that says, things look comfortable, but they're not. Um, so that, that's how I start to think about why, um, you know, that this is, that, that at least under these apparent conditions, we're having um, fewer children, um, but amassing more and more wealth and resources to surround them. Having said that, you know, I'm not one of these people who believes that, I'm talking about evolved developmental mechanisms, whether or not they any longer achieve the fitness ends that they were selected for, to me is a whole different story. I hate the fact that traditional evolutionary psychologists of the David Bus variety say, oh, that's not important, that doesn't matter, we're going to ignore that. To me, it's an empirical question. And that's why I found the persona piece so interesting, because those war evacuees not only matured earlier, they literally had more kids. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily expect that in the modern era. Yes? It, to play devil's advocate, though, is there any actual empirical evidence that the world today is any more uncertain, or that we're any more unlikely to, to face something like that? I mean, the world is less violent, it's more educated, we have better food security than at, really at any point in human history. And yes, there are you know, some but, but at the same terrible time, things that happen. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that, I, I, again, I enjoy this you know, devil's advocate speculation, and that's all I'm doing here. At the same time, think about it this way. If I grow up in a traditional tribal community, the king or you know, the Turkana or wherever else it is, am I bombarded daily with a hurricane devastating people in the Philippines, with a mass murder in a school in Connecticut, with the fact that somebody just got mugged or you know, John F. Kennedy got assassinated 50, 50 years ago. I mean, we have all this incoming information about how dangerous and disastrous the world is, and do our minds, especially our old brains, distinguish the fact that it's distal, not proximate? I don't know. So I think that's something to think about in terms of how we process information and how we translate it in that, into our bodies. Yeah? Just a question about using um, sexual activity as sort of a sense of measurement or marker. Um, do you not think that that might assume too much sexual autonomy on the part of the young women who are studying here? Um, it, it, it certainly does. It certainly does. And that's an interesting question for other cultures where there's much more control of that, of that sexuality. Um, that raises the question of what about I'm going to come boys? back to you. What about the boys? OK. You know, for years in this work, there was virtually no evidence or a rare hint of evidence that, that this didn't go on with the boys. 
or the bare hands of the day, but mostly it wasn't. And the question always was, is that because boys are different um, in this way, according to this theory? I mean, I never set out to write a theory of, um, you know, female development kind of thing. Would I be allowed to? You know, I mean, how politically incorrect is that? Um, and especially because I only have sons, too, on top of it. Um, and my father only had sons on top of that, you know. And my brothers only had sons on top of that. So, what, you know, where do I come into? Um, but I, I was never sure. In fact, what's interesting is, I'll give you another piece of interesting history here, is that when we published this paper initially, we submitted it, one of the reviewers was Eleanor McAbee. I don't know how many of you know who she is. She was one of the grand dames of child development, a Stanford University professor. And Eleanor, to her everlasting credit, I think, you know, wrote in my re in the review in capital letters when this paper when she got to finish it in capital this is a remarkable paper. And then in lowercase letters wrote the rest of the review. The three sentences explained why she thought it was an interesting paper. And then went on for a page and a half to criticize it. And then concluded this paper should be published. Now, I'm sorry, I don't see that kind of open mindedness running around the academy very much. And it was, you know, worth remembering. Um, but she argued this is a theory that doesn't apply to females. You know, it may be true of males, but not to females. Well, I think she was clearly wrong. So the point is the evidence, when people went to test this on males, myself included, the problem was it doesn't, it, the lack of support, was that a function of the fact that? It didn't work there because we just couldn't measure prenatal development as well. I mean, the women in this room remember when they had their first period, I would bet. The men in this room don't have a clue of when they had their first ejaculation, and that would be the comparable thing. So is it, so we lack an indicator. Well, this is what was nice about the NICHD study. It's because we were doing physical exams, or the nurses and the endocrinologists and the pediatricians were, um, we had tanner staging based on physical development, you know, including whatever those beads are where you measure the size of the testicle and compare them to the size of the beads. And this was all Greek to my colleagues and I, but the pediatricians wanted to do this. Well, and, and we went to look at the, when we analyzed the data, we found nothing with boys, which more or less convinced me that this isn't a theory of boys. Now, what's fascinating, and I was going to put this in, but I thought it was too late, but I'm glad I stuck it at the end, is there has been some thinking, and I welcome this comment, because this is a long-winded explanation, um, is what about males? Okay. Janae James, Bruce Ellis, and their colleagues extended the study of the development of reproductive strategy by casting psychosocial acceleration theory in a sex differentiated manner by drawing on sexual selection theory, which highlights fundamental differences in risk and opportunities for males and females. Most notably, they argue the principal trade-off for girls should be early versus later reproduction, whereas for males it should be between mating and parenting. Applying this selection, sexual selection thinking led them to predict the following. For girls, as we've already seen, only what, for girls only would pubertal timing mediate the effect that family experiences on any <coughs> sexual review, first sex, first intercourse, and sexual risk taking, non contraceptive use in pregnancy, consistent with the theory I've been sharing with you. But for boys, it would be self perceived mate value as reflected in social competence, athletic competence, and physical appearance that would mediate the effect of pubertal timing on sexual division and risk taking. And they had data to test this theory. So here you see the data on females. And the dotted lines are about where they're making sex differentiated predictions. So here we see females, father absence, socioeconomic status, and maternal depression, all indicators of that rearing environment are predicting when they're bad, lower quality of relations, thereby earlier maturation, thereby earlier onset of sex, thereby sex, sexual risk taking, just as we've already seen for females. But for males in this data, it didn't work that way. There's no link between quality of family relations and pubertal maturation. Instead, what you see are, are maternal, in this case, maternal depression only predicting mate value, pubertal maturation predicting mate value, more mature boys self-perceive themselves as hotter stuff, and, they're engage, and, and they engage in first sex earlier. So the notion is that this isn't a pubertal maturation process that's regulated by rearing environment in the case of boys. Um, so when you ask, what about boys, you know, <coughs> this, you know, two years ago, I would have said, I don't have a clue. 
these people are proposing have a proposal for what's going on with boys. Yes? Can I just thought that I, I think adding exactly to the, <coughs> the literature, at least on natural fertility populations, is that the, the link between pubertal maturation and um, uh, age at first reproduction or age at first sex is usually quite tight time-wise, right? So for girls, they hit puberty and, and, and usually and start to have sex pretty quickly after that, and then maybe there's some sort of delay with yeah. um, subsanity or something. But for boys, it's, it's there's a much bigger gap typically between puberty Because the older men are sort of regulating their excess. Right. Well, uh, some of it is that, and some of it is that the, it's exactly this, that the things that you need to, to have to attract value are things right. that, that you have to make yeah. reach uh, optimal size right. and, right. and strength. So, so you're back to the same point you're making again well, which is you need to understand the context in which this stuff is working. So where, where pubertal timing is having some modest effect in, in perceived mate value, I mean, what you're saying is in these kind of populations, I may have mature gonads, but I know that my mate value is still pretty low because I haven't you know, hunted any heads, I haven't killed any you know, deer or whatever it is, and you know. Except here, I think you could make an even more uh, sort of physiological link, which is that you may have reached ha have reached pubertal maturation, but your size and strength are still far uh, from from right. Um, what they're going to need their, to be their max. And right. So, yeah. yeah. So. You know, but I want to go back. There was a question back here that I didn't get. Oh yeah, actually, I have two questions. One's pretty fast though. I was just curious with the um with the sort of risk taking model talked about in the first half of the talk. Um, has anyone looked at peer effects and sort of, you know, perceived um, sort of, you know, girls go to school, those who, who mature earlier in terms of pubertal timing are sort of more likely to be perceived as bad girls, risk takers, et cetera, et cetera, and sort of treated that way by their peers. I'm just curious sort of how that related to the, the self-report. Okay, this goes back. I'm not sure this is a direct answer, but it's related here, which is when I broke into that conversation that Caspi and Moffat were having, um, I think it was like 1989, 1990, in the Bosco of Finland, what they were discussing, which would be their soon-to-produce data, which showed that, well, there's plenty of evidence that showed that early maturing girls, you know, did sex, drugs, and rock and roll before later maturing girls. They had girls who they could separate went to all-girls schools and went to co-ed schools. And guess what? In the all-girls schools, you didn't have that association. Because, excuse my bluntness, what happens when you have tits and ass at a young age is, you know, that the male flies hover around you. And they mature you quickly. They, you know, bring you into sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Whereas if you're an immature girl, those older boys aren't interested in you. So it's not, in, so I think that, that speaks to the peer effect. And it looks like it's a male peer effect, which is turning that early maturity into early sexuality. In, a co in an all-girl school, early maturity doesn't accelerate sexuality. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I was also just wondering, um, sort of more broadly, if you could um, maybe sort of expand this um, models into um, the sort of diversity of families that we have today, thinking about father absence and early home stability in, in terms of um, single sex couple households. Well, again, I come back to, for me, as what I would call a proximate process developmental psychologist, the social address of where they've got two mothers, two fathers, you know, cooperative breeders who are caring for you is less important than what that quality of care is. That is, are, is your mind and your body experiencing high levels of investment <coughs> or not? That's the nutrient that affects your development, not the source of that nutrient. Although the source affects the probability of that nutrient. You know, if you've got a single mother who's poor and depressed, we know that her capacity to be sensitive, responsive, and security inducing is lowered. I think for good reason. I think she's evolved to respond that way because she's sending you a signal which is life sucks, prepare for it um, kind of thing. I even start to wonder if under those conditions are parents actually sending their kids a signal, go out in the peer world. I can't help you. Don't tie your wagon to my horses. 
they're starved, they're dead, they're not going anywhere. You going out into the external world and, and, and leaving me behind is actually in your best interest and reproductively in mine. It's not a guarantee of success, but hanging out here and getting my impoverished, inadequate nutrients is a guarantee of failure almost. So um, that's the way I look at it. The, the, the social address of two parents, one parent, cooperative breeds, et cetera, is, is only important to the extent that it probabilistically shapes what actually that psychological parental investment nutrient is whoever's giving it to you. So the, although these, I understand mother absence is less common than single, you know, say father parenting, but you could, you could replace in all of these models sort of, you know, one parent absence? I think so. I think so. In fact, I would argue that when you, we were talking about this today, I was talking about this earlier, if you have father absence, but you have that kind of extended cooperative breeding support network, you shouldn't get the father absence effect. As opposed to when you have father absence and you don't have that cooperative, so then you should. Because the real dynamic, the real causal factor is not the father absence. That's just a marker for a probabilistic process. It's that process of proximate nutrients. Um, let me come back here. Just looking at these male and female neurological pathways, other than cubital maturation, would not the rest of the sort of plot points here seem more reliant on social rather than biological construction? Um, well, I mean, that becomes an interesting question. You know, one of the reasons for me pyramidal development was so important is because the minute it falls out, I don't need evolutionary biology. I'm back to the lower parsimony. This is just, I can deal with this with sociology and psychology. None of these downstream, maybe perceived mate value. But, you know, people have been studying this stuff in other disciplines for years in the standard social science model. Um, and so the minute you take the puberty out, um, the, the, the <coughs> thing is important because it, it says you've got to pay attention to the evolutionary biological framework. It tells you things, it alerts you to things, it highlights things that you don't get from a standard social science model. Um, and so I, I, I think you're right. This could be just more traditional social constructions viewpoint. Um, I'm not sure that social constructions would have a construct of mate value, at least not in that terminology. Um, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, I think we're out of time. Sorry. Oh, can I take one more question? Uh, I was going to comment on a couple of things. One, um, it's ironic. You you mentioned the uh, Bowlby, Lorenz, Ainsworth uh, attachment paradigm. Uh, it, it, it's interesting that it's quite likely that the actual evolutionary circumstance was joint or shared caretaking in the environment of evolutionary adaptation that led to successful... The Sarah Hurdy cooperative breeding predicted, argument. ...predicted, yeah. not this dyadic yeah. model itself, mm -hmm. which leads to a second comment I'd like you to comment on, which is the terminology used here, even in this table, the quality of relationships the uh, warmth, security, attunement, uh, synchrony, yeah. all of the terminology has a moral valence. Absolutely, absolutely. And wouldn't a better terminology be, is it fitted to the context as bracketed in around that child or parent, or is it not? If it is bracketed in and appropriate to the context the child is likely to experience, high risk, uh, high variability, low resource, it's good. Yeah, no, I, I, Otherwise, it's less good in that context. You're speaking so, the, these, so these unilineal, unilineal scales, I, I, where, where upper middle class Americans always turn out yeah. to be sensitive uh, mm -hmm. uh, and have all no, the positive I, this, attributes, is itself part of the claim that you're attacking here. Absolutely. I mean, and, and this is the argument I've made veritably no progress with my developmental brethren who continue to talk about optimal development, optimal parenting, optimal this and optimal that, and it's kind of like, hey folks, it's 22nd century. You know, and the weird thing is, their biological sophistication is great when it comes to DNA, endocrinology, and neuroscience. But when you put that in a larger framework, well they don't. So they've got optimal development, and they've got good, and they've got bad, and they've got all these moral claims, absolutely. But I have made no progress on that score.